African Americans have a rich history when it comes to soil and land. They were brought to this country as slaves. The agricultural economy of this country was built on the backs of African Americans. I briefly worked on a dairy farm in upstate New York in my college years. I learned that it's more than a job, it's a way of life for many people. And that's a way of life that is a traditional way of life. Nobody goes out and starts a dairy farm, or any kind of a farm for that matter. The way you are a farmer in today's world is that you have been passed down that land and that farm from your parents, from your grandparents. So as a documentary photographer, I took it upon myself to travel around the country and document as much as I could, and that's how I created the American Black Farmers Project. The project encompassed four years of shooting, mostly in the South, and I visited about 60 farms around the country. Spending four or five days with each farmer allowed me to really connect with that farmer, it allowed me to uh, understand who he was, what his life was like, and also study his body language, his gesturing, his facial expressions, things that were visually telling to me about who that person was. And I think when we look at the photographs, the most compelling part of this project, and I think what makes this project very unique is the connectivity to the farmers and how that translated visually into photographs. Roger Lamar has a small dairy operation, and the dairy operation has been doing well. He keeps it at a certain level that he feels is manageable for himself. When I first visited Roger, his two young children were in elementary school, and he and his wife and their children were living in a trailer on the property on the farm. And upon visiting him recently, I was glad to see that he finally moved out of the trailer with his family and currently are living in this wonderful house, this beautiful house that's on the farm. Uh, my father, Charlie Lamar Sr., and mother, Peter May, they bought this farm, built the barn, the house, in 1946. And as years rolled on in 76, my brother and myself, we added approximately 150 acres. But uh, over the period of years, it was hard work and dedication. I applied for a farm ownership loan. And over the period of time, they constantly had me reapplying. I applied uh, approximately three times, and it took approximately a year before I got the loan. I needed the money for the purchase cows and operating expenses here. When the prices get low, that finance is not there. And, and you need to keep on going to make the farm more sustainable. You also need a niche market, and mine is custom bale and hay. That's what makes the difference with me. A uh, farmer, he have to have some other income coming in to uh, take up the difference in the farm. Mm -hmm. When I bale 200 bales a day, I'd have made something like $4,000. Yeah. yeah, people don't. Yeah. Uh, in this area, they don't want to hear that. Well, most especially yeah. for a black man. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan continues to work on the farm and help his dad during peak seasons and uh, also helps with the chores on a daily basis. And Jonathan hopes to continue working the farm and keeping the farm operational. My day starts at about 4.30 every morning. I come to the barn, get the cows up, to watch them get them ready for milking. I milk the cows, get them water, feed them, and then at about 8 o'clock, I have to run home and get ready for school. After I come home from school, I get back at around 2.30, 3 o'clock, I come to the barn and do the same thing over again. I really plan to go, go as long as I can with farming, 
I've done it all my life. I can't imagine my life without it. So I have to say I, I keep doing it. The children, they want to stay small, but be productive. My daughter, she's plans on going to veterinary school. My son, he's um, already in college. And I hope they keep the land and keep the farm going as long as possible. I always tell them, you can sell the cows, but don't sell the land. The class action suit brought by black farmers against the USDA in 1996 resulted in some farmers being paid, the majority of them still waiting for those funds to be delivered to them. Roger Lamar actually received settlement from the USDA and uh, those funds were put into the farm. It also helped him build his house. After emancipation, the government said that they would give 40 acres and a mule, which would be substantial land mass, and a mule to work it, and that way a family could take care of themselves. That was under President Lincoln. The slaves never did receive the 40 acres and a mule. That has been a promise to us that the government has failed to keep. However, African Americans were able to amass some acreage so by 1900, 1920, there was approximately six, 16 million acres of black owned land and close to a million black farmers in the United States. You see all these Hofstein heifers, they come from up to the bone. Melvin Bishop is a, a cattle farmer in Eatonton, Georgia. Melvin introduces black family farmers to the idea of organic farming. We decided to do certified organic to create a niche market because in organic, you can do livestock, you can do produce, you can do chicken, eggs, and, and for a small family farm to, to maintain and be able to sustain, that's the area that we're trying to teach the minority farm to go in so it can help sustain their livelihood and make their farm be a much more proper operation. If you don't preserve your history, you don't even know where you've been. How you gonna know where you wanna go if you don't, can't tell where you've been? One of the most compelling statistics to me was the uh, study that was done in Michigan in the mid-90s. And it was uh, about the, the amount of uh, young black farmers going into farming or staying in farming. And the study had found that there were less than 250 black farmers under the age of 25. And when you looked at that statistic and you compared that statistic with the decline of black family farms, it was clear that this is a way of life that is just going to vanish, and it's going to vanish very quickly. For me, part of the story is about racism, and it's about the continuing struggle for civil rights in this country. The forces in this country conspiring against black farmers is primarily racism, which has always been a force racism and then discrimination uh, in lending institutions. When we went to borrow money from the Farmers Home Administration, what we found was that they never did give the amount of money that was needed in order for a farmer to operate his farm. Not only did we not get the amount that was needed, we got the money after the planting season. We have farmers that we know receive their operating loans all the way up as late as September and in September you're usually harvesting your crops. So the fact that you were not able to plant on time meant that you were already going to get a low yield on whatever it was that you planted. When I first visited Willie Adams in central Georgia, Willie had six chicken houses operational, filled to capacity, and he was doing quite well. Upon visiting Willie recently, I was disheartened to see Willie in the condition that he was in. Kegel, poultry sold to Purdue, and uh, Purdue bought and moved to Perry, Georgia. And they said that I was too far away. and. Uh, that they couldn't pick my chickens up. 
And uh, the bad part about it, they didn't give me no warning, didn't tip me anything. They, uh, I was prepared to prepare my housing for chickens and everything, and uh, I was gonna get chickens on a Monday, and two of the representatives from Purdue Poultry came by that Friday and told me, said, well, we won't be able to, to supply you with chicken. I said, why? They said, because you're too far away. He said, we just hadn't got around to notify you that. As a result, he ended up selling three of the chicken houses with the land, and he's struggling to find new ways to make his farm useful and productive. I done some experiment with some squash and uh, tomatoes and uh, cabbage. I hope to come inside here and uh, it's 10 foot from the wall to the post and put in about 12 to 18 inches of topsoil and uh, kind of grow, grow plants out of season, such as uh, collops and uh, uh, salad or whatever in the winter months and other different plants. Well, I'm looking at a picture right here of you with these plants. The last time I was here, Willie, you had a whole bunch of uh, chickens around your ankles. You're going from chickens to plants. I did receive some loans. For instance, when I built my dairy barn, okay, it was going to take $125,000 for the cows and the barn and the equipment to get it up and going. That was used equipment and stuff. They only lent me $80,000. Okay, and mine was just an example of other examples across the country. They only lend you enough money to get in trouble. They know it. They lend you the money to fail, you know. And so a lot of times, they, and you say, oh, well, I know this is what I need. They say, well, this is all we can get. I, my kind of supervisor used to tell me, he said, well, I'll get you a little money. It's time where I'll get you a little money. And they know they're getting you in trouble. It's a feeling that you're a second-class citizen. You're wrapped up in a situation where you have to try to survive. You can't worry about what we've done lost, it's gone. Willie Adams, who also was a member of the class action suit, was denied those funds. Those funds probably would have come in very handy and probably to this day would have helped him sustain his farm during this recent decline he's now seen. The reality of competing with larger corporate operations uh, for all family farms these days, black and white, is going to be, uh, it's, an, it's an uphill struggle. When I first visited the Marable Farm down in southwest Georgia, the farm was uh, in decline. Luther Marable had uh, suffered heart troubles, and as his health declined, so did the farm. James Marable, one of his sons, was uh, in high school, a member of the Future Farmers of America, and was hoping to take over the family farm, continue farming that land. Well, my father was a good farmer because he wasn't scared to take a chance. A good decision or a bad decision, he wasn't scared to take a chance. If he felt like that he wanted to plant 100 acres of peas, that's what he planted, regardless of what the price was when he got ready. And that always was his motto, never be scared. You got to take a chance. This is just a small farm. It's, it's not a big farm. I mean, when we was stretched out farming 1,500 acres, you know, that, that, was, a big, that was a big burden. But... You know, you steady got to stay on your P's and Q's, steady figuring out how you're going to keep your income coming to keep stuff planted, to support your family, to make sure everybody is being paid and whatnot. And then, you know, you gather your crop, you take it to the market, and they take it. They don't want to pay you nothing for it. Financially, what put us in the shape that we were in was we was dealing with a uh, Farmers Home Administration. They'll lend you money to farm with, but the black farmers, when they really need their money is in December, to get ready for the following year, so in January they can start prepping their land. Well, Farmers Home Administration would give the white folks their money during the time they need it so they can get prepped for the next year. But the black farmers, they would get their money more so in March, but 
whatever you ask for, if you needed $60,000 to farm with for this year, Farmers Home Administration wouldn't approve but 30000 So that already cut you in half. Money wasn't being lended, you're having to farm out your pocket. As I got older, I got married, had kids, needed more of my income coming in. So in order to do that, we had to do a lot of cut back, let some land go. Eventually we got all the way down to the home place and that's all we got. It all was driven into the ground that way to the point that you couldn't survive. Morris Marable is James's older brother. Morris's experience in trying to secure funds from USDA and other lending institutions echoes that of James and other thousands of farmers around the country. When I was going to apply for loans, try to get a farming loan, because I was a young farmer, that made me a beginner's farmer. And I went and tried to get the application and stuff, and I explained where I was going to farm at and who was going to be behind me, teaching me how to farm and stuff like that. The guy just plain out come and told me, come out and told me, you would not get along from us. And then another guy told me to go and get some committee members. I had the same people on the committee to we wrote, sat down and wrote letters together and all that and submitted it to him and he still denied me. He just said I didn't have the capability of a farm. But I was born and raised on a farm all my life. What else I know to do? It feels like when you're walking into a door and somebody just keeps slamming them in your face. You know, you know you can go in, but why it's got to be slammed in your face all the time? That's rough. My daddy's health just started declining. It was a lot of factors of working hard. Sometimes you need to eat during the day, you don't. You get up four, five o'clock in the morning and start getting ready. You might not stop until 10, 11 o'clock that night. He had open heart surgery. He had diabetes and then he had a few strokes and next thing we know in 1995 he was gone. Dealing with the racism and the other stuff that come along with farming and getting shut down like you did, it kind of makes you feel angry. But in all in time you feel that if people knew that growing produce was hard as it was, that they would respect the farmer more so and be one willing to help a farmer to make sure that there's plenty of this grown, plenty of that, instead of trying to make a buck off of what a farmer grows from taking his product that he worked so hard at. With the pressures of dealing with Farmer's Home Administration, it just takes everything from you. My opinion about farming is, the way it seems, they don't want no small farmers and they don't want no black farmers. That's what they seem like they're pushing it to, is they're trying to stop us all from farming. Some of the best people out of farmers ever know was black. And uh, them guys, they, they worked them farms hard all their lives, took care of their families, everybody did good, got along good and all. And now there's just so many of them, you can't really count them on one hand. You know, they don't count as two hands, there ain't enough of them to count. And that's making the younger black guy, the young guy that come off the farm, go looking for something else to do, because they see their granddaddies, their daddies, their uncles, cousins, they're catching so hard trying to farm. So if you if they going through all this hard time now, how hard is it gonna be for you another 10 years? It ain't gonna be no little farmers. And if they can squeeze everybody off the land, that's what they're gonna do. Big guys gonna come in and buy it all and everybody gonna be in trouble. Everybody had to move to town. And nobody wants that. Today, the federal government says that there are 28,000 black farmers left in America. Our statistics show closer to 18,000 black farmers that are left in America, all operating about 3 million acres of land. Transitioning this farm back to you working on it, I mean, what, do you, what else are you looking forward to, uh, you know, perhaps starting your fields and planting? Well, the, the biggest thing is the vegetables. Produce. Produce, yeah. Okay, so you'll go produce. back to produce. Yeah. yeah. Produce is the number one thing, you know. James Marable currently is driving a truck interstate. And while his hopes are to come back to the farm and build up the farm once again, the likelihood of that happening are going to be uh, very difficult. The cost of starting up a farm, reinvesting money in equipment, or even repairing the equipment that's existing is going to be a really costly proposition. 
Farming is my life and always was my life, but I had to do something a little different. Now my goal is one day before I leave Mother Earth here is to uh, be farming again. <laughs>